Okay, our next speaker, Pick. Now, I haven't, I've only met Pick today. As, and as, what's your dog's name? Fido. Fido. Oh, there you go, Fido. <laughs> so I only met Fido today, but uh, Pick's a character. I can tell that. I had a quick look on the website yesterday. Um, he started, started out in 2008 with a tonne of Aussie peanuts and a concrete mixer. Sounds like my sort of guy. I like concrete mixers. Selling jars of peanut butter at the local farmer's market. Soon stretched to a nationwide, soon stretched that to nationwide supermarkets. Now, Pick's peanut butter is sold around the world, including back to Australia. He's a graduate of the Ice House Owner Manager Program and a great ambassador for the Nelson region. I'll be down there in a week's time, so uh, look forward to getting to Nelson. So, Pick, come up to the stage. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Well, tena, tena koto, everybody. It's, uh, Wonderful to be here. It's a little, 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 bit, little bit like Nelson, and, and that uh, you know we've got a small town here, and uh, we can get phenomenal support you know, from your community. It's been one of the neat things about uh, about being based in Nelson. So um, about 25 years ago, I was on a friend's boat, American guy's boat, and uh, and he said, "What would you like for lunch?" And I said, "Oh, I'll, 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 what would you like in a sandwich?" I said, "Have you got any peanut butter?" And he hauled out a jar of peanut butter. It was called Health Style. And I hadn't heard of health style peanut butter before and I had no idea how peanut butter could be made healthier than, you know, peanut butter. So I had a look at the label I could read in those days and, uh, and it was called health style because it had reduced added sugar added to it. And I thought, Jesus, if this is that common in America, you know, sooner or later we're going to get it turning up in New Zealand. If, if you know, you could reduce the, the added sugar you added sugar was something that was going to be a, a dead sitter to appear in New Zealand peanut butter. And so it turned up about 15 years ago. Uh, and it sort of came in the, you know, the, the, the eater and stuff with the dancing cartoons of peanuts on the, on the lid and, and brightly coloured. I thought this is for kids. And uh, so, so I used to carefully avoid buying this stuff. And because I love peanut butter, I really, you know, it was one of my staples. And then one day I thought, oh, you know, I'm not going to be bothered. I'll just get a jar of home style. And I bought a big <laughs> jar of home brand peanut butter, took that home, it was one kilo. And I took the lid off, all excited, you know, there's great lots of peanut butter and I wasn't going to run out for a wee while. Put a whole lot on my sandwich and had a mouthful and it was full of sugar. And I was so disappointed and I, and I, I rang the 0800 number on the jar and I said, look, why are you putting, peanut butter, putting uh, sugar in my peanut butter? And they said, well, we do market surveys, sir, and that's the way everyone likes it. So I thought, well, you know, not really. And um, my mum and auntie, when they bought these, bought, they, they bought Vitamizers back when I was about uh, 15, I think, was like the Nutribullet of the day. And uh, one of the recipes was for making peanut butter. And so, and, and so I knew how it was done, because and, and, they used to just roast a few peanuts in the oven and then put them in the blender and squish them up. And usually it was burnt, but it tasted you know, really pretty nice, especially when it was fresh. And so I knew how it was done. So I, um, I, I, just, I went down to, to, to Bin Inn and, and bought myself a, a, a kilo or two of peanuts and stuck them in the oven and put them in the blender and blew up the blender. And, went and bought another one, got one, a really, really cheap one that had a, had a, had a three-month warranty on it. And I, I went through quite a number of those. <laughs> um, but I, I figured out how to, how to make the peanut butter. It's, it's really simple. So you get peanuts, roast them, squash them, and, and, and uh, put them in a jar. And uh, so, but it tasted really good. You know, it tasted so much better than the stuff I'd been buying. And my son was 12 at the time. I was a solo dad. He was 12, and he really liked it too. And, 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 but what, what really nailed it was when one of his mates came around and offered me five bucks for a jar of this peanut butter. I mean, this is a 12-year-old kid, you know, giving me five bucks from his pocket money for a grocery thing. So um, we did the deal, and I thought... And at the time, so, so stepping back a bit, I, I, um, I had a sailing school in Nelson. I was teaching keeler sailing, because I, I used to like sailing a lot. And um, I started, you know, my eyesight was sort of failing. I've got macular degeneration, which affects your central vision. And I'd known about it for a long time, but it just sort of started getting worse. So I had to give up the sailing school because I could no longer be sure of finding the marina at the end of the lesson. <laughs> and, um, I, uh, and I was left with a little laundromat where the Gotties used to wash their clothes down at the marina. And, and um, I was sort of retired. And, and the laundromat was pulling in a couple of hundred dollars cash and I could pick it up on Friday, Friday afternoon. And, wander around in the weekend with, with, a, with a pocket full of money. And then the laundromat had to go. The uh, lease expired or something. And I thought, oh, you know, I'd be, if I could get my 200 bucks back, I'd be, you know, be feeling much better about that. And I thought, well, if I made peanut butter, if I made, if I made enough peanut butter, you know, $200 worth of peanut butter, $200 worth of, you know, your GP on my peanut butter, um, 
I could, you know, I could, I could do that. And so I thought, well, if I made peanut butter on Friday morning and sold it, there was a farmer's market on Friday afternoon, I could get this 200 bucks. So I, I bought, um, I spent 10 grand and I bought a, this concrete mixer we talked about, which was a stainless steel thing that had been, there's a, the outfit down in, the, in, the, in Westport that had been making concrete mixers since the year dot. So your, your mums and dads, your dads, well, mums and dads, of course, will have had an able concrete mixer and they're still down there. They're, they're run by some brethren and they make concrete mixers. They, they made a, a stainless steel version for mixing foodstuffs in and they'd also made one for somebody uh, with a burner underneath it. So this was made a sort of a rotary oven because part of the issue with roasting peanuts in the oven is that they burn at the back, in my oven they do anyway. And so I bought this concrete mixer, for about $7,000, and uh, I found an old grinder. They used to make peanut butter at our bin inn and um, they just stick peanuts in a grinder and, and grind them up and you got sort of average peanut butter because the, the peanuts would have been roasted months before, goodness knows we're probably in China. And um, so I, I bought this little this grinder, it was a bench top peanut grinder, and I went around looking around for peanuts, someone who'd sell me you know, wholesale peanuts, and I found an Australian guy up, up in Auckland who was representing a, 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 um, a PCA, a company in Australia, and he would sell me uh, 20 or, or 40 25 kilo bags for a hell of a lot better price than, than I could buy them locally. So I bought this, bought the two two thousand dollars I think for this ton of peanuts, and they came down in a pallet, and I went out and stored them out in their local cool stores. And on Fridays I'd go and pick up a, or Thursdays I'd go and pick up a sack of peanuts, chuck it in the back of the car, and take it home. And I had the concrete mixer set up in my garage, and I had the grinder up in the kitchen upstairs. And so, and then I'd go and buy a um, couple of dozen jars from Arthur Holmes with little black lids. And, um, and roast the peanuts, carry them upstairs, grind them up, put them in jars and, and sell them in the market. And it really worked. So the first time I went down, I think we sold out. And uh, I went back the next week and all these people who bought it the week before came back to get more. And then I started getting people from out of town saying, oh, you know, my, I'm from Auckland, my friends came up and they had this peanut butter and they said, told me to come and I had to come and get some. They'd buy four jars. We set up a little mail order business so that people who had tried it could continue to get it. And I just was very happy. I was, I was, um, I actually, that, that year, I, the next, that year, I, this was about November, I guess. Um, the next year, I started a full time creative writing course at our local Polytech because that was something I always wanted to do. And, you know, I was sort of a retired guy. And, uh, you know, the peanut butter was, was fun. I, I really enjoyed doing the market. And uh, we eventually moved from the farmer's market to the Nelson, famous, Nelson's famous uh, Saturday market. Um, so, and I was, you know, I was just making this peanut butter in the garage at home and then Nita, who runs the market, started getting cross about, uh, about me making peanut butter in the garage. She said, you really can't do that, you know, you can't do, you can't, you've, got to get, you've got to get yourself a, a proper kitchen. So I hunted around for a kitchen. I eventually, came, we've got an old meatworks in Nelson, like every town's got an old meatworks. And, um, their, and their laundry was sort of vacant. The old laundry was full of junk. And I leased this, I managed to, I get a, got a lease on this for a couple of hundred dollars a week. And um, cleared, cleared out all the junk and started painting it up. And, uh, and I thought, well, we'll put a hand basin in here, you know, just to get flash, a little food safety thing. And I started putting this hand basin in, and then the local health inspector from the council came around, you know, the guy who inspects shops and things. And he came around and had a look and said, oh, this is good. You can washable walls and floors and ceilings. And, What's that guy doing in the corner? I said, oh, he's, you know, pretty obvious. It was a plumber. He's putting in a hand base. And he said, oh, have you got a building consent for that? And I, I said, well, well, no, he's just putting in a hand base. Well, well, I'll come back when you've got a building consent and we can sign you off. So I went to the council to get a building consent. They said, no, well, we don't actually need a building consent, but you need a resource consent. You know? <laughs> so they followed four or five months mucking around with the council, going backwards and forwards with dangerous goods inspectors doing calculations on how much fire a tonne of peanuts would support. Finding out, finding out how far the sewer was above some something sort of you know th three miles away, and, and uh, I made a guess at that actually, and I wrote it down, and, and they were happy with that. And then we're starting to get to car parks. We're about to put a notification outside this shed, outside this little this little you know old laundry, to say that we wanted to do this thing. And and uh, I kept 
So I said, why are we doing this? And anyway, then the council, I got a letter from the council saying, we don't understand why you're applying for a resource consent for this minor thing, and if you uh, want to uh, uh, re re remove your, your application in writing and pay the in costs incurred to date, we will just, uh, we'll just give you your, your permission to go ahead and put this hand basin in. So, <laughs> and I was very proud of myself. I wrote in and thanked them profusely for all the good work they'd done to date and, and offered, offered to, told them where to send the bill to and uh, I never got one. Anyway, so we got started and it was amazing to actually be do it because it was, it drained so much of, our enthousi of my enthusiasm when this whole performance was going. All I wanted to do was start making peanut butter. I was actually making peanut butter in there but I just wanted to get that little certificate. So, um, and, and we had a bit more room than actually needed in this little workshop, in this, in this, in this, in this um, space there. And so I sublet it to uh, another couple, uh, uh, Anatoth Jam. So that started off in Nelson. I can remember when I, was, I used to live in Auckland and I can remember friends going down to Nelson and coming back with jars of Anatoth Jam and being told they had to bring it back when they went there. So it was really interesting for me. These guys had, uh, Owen and Kay Pope had, had, owned, had, had, had owned Anatoth Jam had sold it and then they'd started up making their own brand of jam and we sublet the back of it to them and um, interesting couple, they were sort of, uh, Owen was a big fat, that's, anyway, uh, and they, they were an interesting couple and they were making their jam out the back there and they had a couple of people working for them who, um, main, their main job was, was when, when the, uh, the Popes were away was, was to tell, the, uh, tell suppliers that the cheque was in the mail and that kind of stuff. Uh, they were dutifully making an ama amazing job and so dedicated to this jam, they came to work for me. So um, I then had a couple of people working with me and we started, so we start, got, um, they put us, we got a, uh, a, um, got a HACCP program going and we were able to, we got approval to sell into, uh, well we got into Faro first of all. And uh, our local, our local um, Fresh Choice uh, supermarket, which had, was amazingly supportive. And in fact, when they first came along, they said, we'd like um, four dozen jars. And at that time, I was making, you know, sort of a couple of dozen for the market and, and making four dozen. Oh, crazy, you know, this is madness. Anyway, we did, and we got it in there. And they took a hell of a risk because we didn't even have this, you know, this certificate from the council at that time. But... Um, <laughs> So that, that, you know, as I said, but by the time you know, but, but, but um, by the time we, we came to, to you, see you, Janine, we had all the certificates. And, <laughs> so <yeah. laughs> uh, one of the cool things about about this time too was that uh, we got um, uh, Cuisine Magazine had a artisan food thing, and I thought I don't actually remember whether we actually whether we had to enter it or, um, but we won an award. We got an award from them. And we had a beautiful full-page article when a professional photographer came down and had took a photo of me standing beside my concrete mixer. And it, was, it was really cool. And so, you know, a little bit of recognition there was really useful. Um, we, so we started selling into the supermarkets, um, started off with foodstuffs, and I, and I trotted around the country um, giving people tastes and, and stuff. And then um, we were contacted by Progressive, and, and they said they'd like to stock it as well. Uh, and we, we went along, um, we started, we got up to making about a thousand jars of peanut butter a week and that was a pallet, you know, and, and, um, and I thought, yeah, this is good. You know, I had a couple of people working there and I thought, you know, we're make, turning over 5,000 bucks or something and I thought, I don't want to get into, I don't want to, I don't want to stress out about this. I'm a retired guy, I don't want to, you know, sort of get into worrying about invoicing staff and forklifts. And, um, and then one day a, a, a pallet of jars arrived, there's 1,500 jars on a pallet and they're all, you know, on layer stacked. And it was on the back of the truck. And none of the neighbours' forklifts were available. And I went around the corner and I leased or bought a for leased a forklift. And I thought, oh God, I've got a forklift now. So, well, anyway, we'll just see where it ends up. So that's sort of what we're still doing. So we're, we're, we're run. <laughs> we've now got four forklifts and about sort of 600 invoicing staff. Well, that's a lie. But um, we have people there who, who are just overjoyed when when GST time comes around. And I mean, that had been always my issue, you know, as a guy who makes stuff. I'd had lots of business in the past. I hated doing the paperwork, but to discover there are people out there who love doing things like, um, you know, the GST was a revelation for me. <laughs> and so, and so, and so, um, 
Yeah, we got the. Uh, we decided decided to go for it. I, I had a I had a, about a half million dollars worth of stocks and things, you know, to to retire on, and so I cashed all them in and went to China and they had a go to a machinery show in Guangzhou there, and they they have you know miles and miles of machines and I went there with my with, with this pocket full of money, and um, and went around buying things. And, oh, and I was already fairly blind and these guys were sort of. <laughs> flogging stuff off. So I bought two containers worth of, of um, stainless steel machines. I'd never seen inside a food factory in my life. And I just was trying to figure out, well, if, if this, can, this can fill, you know, 200 jars an hour and, and this roaster can roast sort of, you know, half a ton of peanuts a day. And I was doing, you know, anyway, I came back with all this stuff. Most of it didn't work at all. And, and, we, and, I, and we leased after, and we'd, I'd also found an empty factory, a, a new warehouse that had, that had been sitting empty for a couple of years. And I leased that, and so we moved all this machinery in there. And, um, uh, and most of it didn't work. So, but enough of it worked that we were able to make almost as much peanut butter as we made in the little factory, you know, down the road there. <laughs> and, but but we, we kept at it, so it was enough money to keep, you know, our heads above water. And uh, I, I had this amazing mentor next door, this old guy who sat in a, in a little office by, beside the meatworks. It was a, straight out of the 40s, this office. And, and Bill was surrounded by paper. And he owned half the industrial land uh, down in Nelson. And his um, son had a property development company, a, a building construction company, Coman Construction. And so Bill was an amazing guy. He's, he, he, he'd, we'd, I'd sit down with Bill. He really was really interested in what we were doing. He always wanted to invest in us, but we didn't, didn't sort of need that. Um, and so after we moved into this first little factory um, and we started realising, you know, running out of space and things, I went, went to Bill and he said, look, I'm going to build a new place up the road. We could lease half of that to you. So we ended up with two factories. Um, we continued with the one, the, the original one, then we built another one, and we sublet the back half of that to the neighbours of Courier PBT. And um, eventually, you know, within six months, we'd taken over the back space as well. So we were now in two different factories. We were employing something like 30 people. Uh, and we started exporting. I think we started off in Australia. So my sister lives in Australia, and, and, and she was keen to you know, make some money out of this. So she started, she did mail order. So she, we sent her a pallet of peanut butter over to Australia. And my sister sold about four cases and the rest of it went out of date. But, we, but it, was, it, gave us, it gave us, you know, this, this inn in Australia. So that people, Australian people who are buying our peanut butter were, um, were able to get it. And that's always been really important for me because, you know, we've always been a, a, a consumer-driven thing. I, I don't believe you actually sell anything to the supermarket. You sell, sell it to people. And so our strategy on that front has always been to get it into the hands of people, and then they'll they'll drive the you know the supermarkets and um, you know with all with all due respect, um, I, I I think you know supermarkets and and retailers are just another step on the chain. They're like couriers and truckers and stuff, and except they've got a different payment model, but they're just part of the chain of, of getting your stuff to the to the to the customer. So anyway, um, we started growing. Uh, I don't know. We, you know. Anyway, we now make uh, about 20,000 jars of peanut butter a day, and we've got 45 staff. Um, I have a have a full time CEO. So, when I first looked at tipping my, you know, my pension, my retirement fund into the business, I rang up my brother up there in Auckland, who's a stockbroker. He's the only sort of business guy I knew. I was all hanging out with artists and sailing people and all that sort of stuff, and nobody had any money. And so Phil knew some friends. He said, "Oh, look, I've got my mate." Uh, um, um, Keith, and uh, he's, he's, he was involved, he was, uh, he was a CEO, Keith Jackson was a CEO of Teagle at some stage, and uh, a very capable guy and, uh, with FMCG. So he came on as an advisor and he also brought his brother-in-law who'd been working with um, Cerebus, Stu uh, Stuart McIntosh. And so they worked as us, worked with me as consultants, they all wanted a, a share of the business at the time, but I, I, I held on to it. And um, then Stuart kept doing more and more work for us, and so now he's our CEO. He lives in Auckland, commutes to Nelson, and he actually stays with me. So uh, my son's moved out. He's 22 now. He's gone down to Christchurch. And uh, Stuart comes and stays with me for three or four nights a week, which is amazing. You know, I, I think if anybody, if, uh, and I think it's something I'd like to do if, with our overseas um, employees is 
rather than have an office, get an apartment and you know, go and stay there with these guys because it's such a valuable way of keeping in touch with what's going on. Um, I've stepped back, I'm now calling myself founder and it took a bit of getting used to, you know, sort of giving up being CEO and, and but it's wonderful because I, I say, oh, Stu's CEO, just ask him, he knows all the numbers and all that sort of stuff and I just get to flaunt, flounce around sort of um, talking to people, kissing babies and doing food shows <laughs> and that kind of stuff. So now I'm hoping to leave some time for questions. So how are we going here? Richard? Yeah, oh, okay. Oh, good. All right. So, um, gosh, maybe someone can give me a question now. Just because I've... Yeah. Right, so um, even before I had this peanut butter experience on somebody's boat, I was in a mate's shower down in Christchurch, and he had, he had all, these, all these jars, all these bottles of shampoo and stuff around, the, around on top of the shower, as you do. And I, and I grabbed a green one, and I you know, had a sniff, and it smelled like mint sauce. And, and I thought, you know, and I looked at the label, and it said something, it said something like this, it said something like, Bob's Mint Shampoo. It smells like mint sauce. <laughs> and, I, and I had this huge surge of affection for this stupid shampoo, you know, because you, you're so used to picking up something and it says forest glade mint with all the freshness of aromas and blah, blah, blah. And it really, it sort of, I thought, wow, I like this stuff. So that was, and I just sort of tucked that away just as a, as a thing. Um, and when I started making the peanut butter, I, I, uh, I just wanted it to be really real, so I, I bought, I got the glass jars. I had, she had to ask, I asked around quite a lot because I thought plastic would be better because it was less weight, you know, there was less chance of damaging it in, in, in transport and stuff, but I did actually go to glass in the end. And so I got glass jars and I found these, you know, snappy, shiny black lids for them. And, uh, and as a label, I really wanted to make it sort of real. And so instead of just going out and going out and buying, you know, reams of paper or whatever, or buying special label stuff, I thought I'm going to use something, you know, real, like you know, butcher's paper, just brown paper, wrapping paper, you know, like like you buy in big for if, in your shop, wrap stuff, or used to. So I bought a, um, I, b I bought these huge sheets of of paper and cut them up with a. Stanley knife and cut them down to a sort of an A4 size, and, and I got myself a little, bought myself a laser printer because um, I, I was actually quite keen to get a printer anyway. So and so I bought a laser printer, <laughs> and I and I just made up these little labels and I used Comic Sans. I suppose we've got a few designers here. They go, oh my God, Comic Sans! I got quite attached to that. It's a it's a font. It's a terribly untrendy font for those who don't know. But I quite liked it, and um, and I just designed this label, and I just I just you know talked about the peanut butter, and and initially I thought, oh, people, a lot of people out there don't like peanut butter, so I, maybe I thought I should call it something other than peanut butter, and and I thought, well, peanuts something, and then I thought, no, whatever it is, you know, people would say, oh, what's peanut paste? You'd be saying, oh, well, it's peanut butter, you know, and so I thought I'm not going to be bothered with that, and. Um, and that, and that, the other thing that I, the other thing I, I, I call it picks because I'd had a before this, I'd uh, a while before this, I'd had a charter boat directory, and and I'd call it Pico's Charter Guide, and so and having my name on it had been really uh, useful as far as being able to introduce myself once the charter charter guide became known. There's probably some of you might remember this. We had a few Taupo boats and. In the charter guide, anyway. So I, I, um, I thought I'd put my name on it, and uh, and um, we had a little around the um, around the border on the on the first label. I'd I'd found you know in, in the in the Microsoft you know choices of, of um, uh, lines and things, you could have a little series of wee stars. So I put sort of wee stars around it. It looked quite snazzy. It looked a bit sort of like a circusy kind of thing. And um, so we had this thing with a, with a nice brown labels. The, what, the labels were horrible to put on. You had to print these things out, and then I had a guillotine, and I'd cut up, I'd cut up the. Um, no, first of all, I get the A4 sheet and stick double-sided tape down both sides of it, each side of it, and then get a guillotine and chop these things up, and, and so you'd get five uh, labels out of a sheet. But 
peeling that, peeling that double-sided tape off is just a horrible, horrible job. And you know, your, your final touch to your jars of peanut butter was a horrible thing. You, it would have been really lovely, just, oh, labels on, but no, horrible. Anyway, um, so we had the nice label and we had this nice lid. And then our lid supplier, we were buying, we started, we were buying the buying the jars by the pallet, and they were supplying us with the lids as well. And they um, they said to us one day, they said, "Oh, if you order a hundred thousand lids, you can have free printing on them." And I, I first of all thought, hundred thousand lids, hundred, you know, like hundred thousand, that at five dollars a jar, that'd be, you know, as you all know, half a million dollars. And and I I thought, well, but they didn't. They said, "Oh, well, you don't have to actually buy all the lids at once. You can just take them, you know." 5,000 at a time, which we were sort of doing anyway. So I had to decide what would look nice on our lid, uh, and I thought, well, a, a red star would look nice. And um, so is that, is that getting time to go? <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Um, so I thought a red star would look nice, so we put a red star on the lid. And, and I didn't, any, and, and it's been an amazing thing. That red star on our lid has been so distinctive. I mean, I wear one, got one there. And, People seem to recognise that I'm not a beer guy or I'm not, you know, from Chinese, whatever these things. And, and it's, it's been incredibly powerful. And one of the finest things about our jars is that they get reused. So instead of sending them off to recycle and, and, and melting the glass down, uh, people just wash them and then they put their own preserves and pickles on them. And so we've got, you know, Kiwi aunties and stuff giving jars of homemade pickles to their nieces and nephews. Any, any church... Or, or school fair you go to and there's pickles, there's always our jars there. It's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. Everybody knows they're ours, but um, it's just been, it's been really special, really special uh, part of that for us. Uh, so that's where the star came from. So it was just, you know. <laughs> another, another question. I'm a bit blind, so you might, you'd have to, hmm? Over there. Yeah. I I don't know, but I th I mean I don't I don't really have an answer, uh, but I think it was it was hugely exacerbated when peanuts w it was decided that peanuts were an allergen, and I mean when I was you know it's always been the case that you know you don't feed your children peanuts until they're three, because they're going to choke. But once peanut, it was sort of decided that peanuts were an allergen, I think people started hearing that as, God, don't feed your, peanut, your children peanuts until they're three. It was don't give them peanut butter or anything, don't ever, because they'll die from an allergen. And I think that has really exacerbated the problem. You know, I think kids haven't been getting that stuff. That's a wonderful food for babies. But uh, people were just too, too scared to feed it to their, to, their, to their kids because they got muddled up about this choking hazard and, and eating peanuts. Um, I know that in Kingaroy, where we get our peanuts from, uh, there's 10,000 people. Nobody's ever had a, a peanut allergy. The air is just thick with peanut dust. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's it's hard to know. But I, I think that has been a lot to do with it. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't know. We used to carry an EpiPen when we did markets and things in case you know somebody got an allergy. And, and a, but the actual notion of you know pulling someone's pants down and jabbing them with a pen. <laughs> Um, really, it was a bit, bit beyond um, our... <laughs> yeah. Uh, another question? Oh, they Well, so, so peanuts are grown... Most of the world's peanuts are grown in China. They grow about 10 million tonnes. America grows about 3 million. Um, we use a high oleic peanut, which, is, which we just fluked on when we bought our first load of peanuts from Australia. And the high oleic... Nuts and seeds are a variety. I don't know. They were just a, a breeding thing that changes the nature of the oils in an oil-bearing seed or nut. And so the high lack peanut, high lack peanuts increases the. Oh, I don't know. That's one of these or fatty things. You know, the monosaturated fat, whatever it is, the, the healthy fat. So it makes a, it makes for healthier fats in the peanut butter, but it also protects it from rancidity. 
So you'll often you'll buy a Chinese peanut butter and it'll be and it'll be rancid by the time you open it. So it's got a musty taste, smell, or, or maybe a metallic sort of aftertaste, and that's rancidity. And happens really easily, um, you know, with with any any sort of oily nut. But the but the um, higher lap peanuts seem to just don't. That doesn't happen with them. And so it was just a thing that we fluked on initially. They also, they also grow higher like nuts in, in Argentina. And when, when there were some floods in, um, in Queensland, we went to Argentina and, and bought Argentinian nuts for a few months. I think most of our competition in New Zealand are using Argentinian nuts now, and, but we're sticking with Australian. Uh, yeah, despite our peanut company just having changed hands, so it was a grower cooperative that became a company but it was having in serious financial trouble and sold, was sold to Bega, um, the, the dairy company in Australia, last year. And they, Bega also owns, they recently bought the Vegemite brand and the Kraft peanut butter factory and brand, although the, the dispute, Kraft is disputing whether they bought the brand or anything to identify. But anyway, so we're now buying peanuts from a competitor in the Australian market, although they are they're, they're a, 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 a daily, a, a cheapo peanut butter and, and we're a different thing. So I'm off to see these guys on, in Melbourne on Thursday, have our first face-to-face uh, -face talks with them. Was that your question? <laughs> yeah, well, I see, yes, sort of. You know, I mean, I don't bother. I mean, if... if, if um, if this is, so this is in relation to the oil separates from the peanuts. So we, we don't because we don't put emulsifiers in. Emulsifier is uh, the emulsifier. Typical emulsifier for peanut butter is hydrogenated palm oil. So they take palm oil and they I don't know they bubble hydrogen through it or something, and it turns what is you know just a, uh, just a just a sort of unpleasant and unhealthy oil into a poisonous oil, and they add this to the peanut butter and they mix it all up and it never separates. So it's never oily, never dry, but always horrible. And so, uh, and so in our peanut butter, the, if, if it sits around for maybe three to four months, it will start to separate. And if it's been sitting around for a year, we've actually got a two-year shelf life. If it's sitting around for a year, you'll get a layer of oil on the top. You have to mix that in before you eat it. And you've got to mix it seriously. It's like mixing paint. You can't just wave a teaspoon in it. You've got to get anyway. But once you've done that, it won't separate again. But if you, get, if you, if you, if you find your peanut butter is oily on the top, you know, if you don't mix it up, it's going to be dry on the bottom. So don't ring me and say my peanut butter is dry on the bottom, you know, because it's your fault. So that's what happens. Um, so, but turning it upside down, see, turning it upside down, if the oil is separated, turning it upside down won't do any good at all, you know. You've got to mix it up. You know, it's hard work. It's not just a matter, just to, you know, if you've got problems with your wrist, get somebody to, else to do it. Okay. What, what do you think you've been Sorry? What do you think you've been um, It has been an amazing, it is an amazing product, you know, it is an amazing product. And I think, as a peanut butter, my, peanut butter eater myself, it was, a, it was a guilty secret. You know, if somebody said to you, some fancy food people, you know, Ginny said to you, what's your favourite food? And I said, peanut butter. You know, the 10 years ago, I said, peanut butter. She said, you know, I mean, I, I used to go into Sabato, you know, a new market. I go in there and say, look, I'm, I'm the first visits, one of the first, oh, look, I make peanut butter. And you could see that saying, oh, oh, well, our customers drizzle olive oil on their toast, you know, <laughs> <laughs> lying through their teeth. So, and I think that, I think, you know, as peanut butter eaters, we were, we were being really treated like rubbish. And I think we, I really do. And I think you know, actually respecting, uh, respecting our customers has been huge. Um, and, and the rest of it has just been, you know, letting people go for it and just trying to be as real as we can and, uh, yeah, and having, well, we've got a story, you know, and, um, yeah, just, just, just letting people tell it themselves. So we don't advertise, so it's on, it's the responsibility of, of, our, of our customers to tell their friends, and they do that. And I know a lot of you will have done that, and so thank you incredibly much because it's given me a fantastic life. It's just... <laughs> Yeah, so thank you. Yeah.
Uh, thanks, Pick. There's no no question that entrepreneurs tell the best stories, and it's uh, it's a fantastic. And he, I didn't know he was a character, but I guessed he was, and uh, that proved to be the case. I think uh, just a couple of quick lessons before I hand over to Katie. Um, you know, a lot of what what Pick said, the Ice House could wrap a framework around. I've got I've got no doubt about that. But I love the common sense approach. I mean, if they said plot your competitors to pick, he he could get a whiteboard out and say oh, they're all over here. They price point here and they taste like this. He just did it out of common sense and that's what I love about entrepreneurs. They actually quite often do what you could go to the ice house and learn but it's just innate in them and they make it happen. So it's a, yeah, it's a fan fantastic story. He's got another one, hang on. I must say that I did do an ice house OMP course and it was one of the best things I've ever done. So actually getting together with people and realising that because my handicap I was already doing that delegating stuff, but actually getting together with people in similar businesses was just phenomenal. So I, I forgot to mention that. So, you know, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>